Hi guys, thank you for joining us on Monitano. Today I am talking with Ngugi Wathiongo, which is an honor for me uh, and very much a treat for you. Thank you so much Ngugi for talking with us. My pleasure. I like your blogs? Yes. Uh, or oh, is your channel? I like I yeah. I like your channel. Yes. Right? And actually I do visit your channel, I like the videos you put there, the issues you raise in your channel. So I'm actually one of your fans. Thank right? you. Mm -hmm. That's that's very much an honor. Uh, for the ones of you who don't know Ngugi Wathiongo, um, it is imperative that you read Decolonizing the Mind, The Politics of Language in African Literature. That one is a must read for all Africans. It's a must read for all people, even in in Southeast Asia, in Latin America. It is a must read for all peoples who've had a similar colonial uh, history. Uh, and the author of that book is none other than Gugi Wathiongo. Uh, he's also author of a number of other books, some of which I have mentioned in prior videos. Um, and he is a legend, a living legend, that I have the honor today of talking to. So again, thank you very much, Ngugi. Yeah, thank you. Um, now, one of the things that you are known for mm -hmm. is having made the decision to yeah. write in Kikuyu as opposed to writing in English, because you are saying that for Africans contributing to an African literature entails writing in an African language. So you made that decision to write in Kikuyu, um, and I wanted to ask you about maybe some of the challenges that you experienced in making that decision, which is very much a decolonized sort of decision to make. First of all, let me say, it's natural for everybody to write in their own language. Uh, there's nothing wrong in writing in another person's language. Again, some people do that. But when it's a whole intellectual community mm. of a given community who do that, who can only write or see themselves or define themselves in another people's language, then there's something not right about you know that. Uh, but quite frankly, it's not simply a matter of morality. It's a matter of our relationship to the colonial process, mm -hmm. right? Um, whenever one people have colonized another, the first thing they do is impose their language on that community, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, the Spanish did it in in, in South America, uh, Portuguese in Brazil. Uh, the French did it in Fran in uh, Africa, in Asia. The Japanese did it in Korea, and so on. Uh, and there's a reason for this, uh, because when you impose your language on other people, you are also not giving them a culture and a history from which to view mm -hmm. themselves, okay? And by the same token, when you uproot them from their own languages and so on, you are also uprooting them from the language, the culture, and the history and the people who created that language, you know. So for me personally, I had no problems in um, resuming writing in Kikuyu after many years of writing in, uh, in English. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems, quite frankly, was purely psychological when I began. I was wondering, can I do it? It's possible, right? Mm -hmm. Because my growing up in school and um, other places, you know, 
the language or my conceptualization of the world was English. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I would ask myself, is possible to say certain things in a Creole language? And my mind tell me, no. The, the seductive voice in me, the one I've been trained to think you can't do anything in a Creole language, will tell me, no, you cannot. It's easy. No, it's easier. Why bother? It's easier to say it in English, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, this word exists in English, you know. Why look for another word, you know, in Ikoyo? Why invent the wheel? I, oh, I don't know what, what other, you know, uh, uh, negative um, images I may have had, you know. Um, so that's one thing. But surprisingly, when I began to write in Ikoyo, I found uh, that I knew more Ikoyo mm -hmm. than I was willing or to believe or than what I'd come to think was not possible, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That's one problem. The other problem, so I had to overcome that and quite fortunately that was overcome by being in imprisoned in a maximum security prison in Kenya mm -hmm. in 1977 to 78 mm -hmm. precisely for having written a play in a choir and having it performed mm -hmm. in a community. Mm -hmm. So in prison as I thinking what about the whole language thing all over again? What is going on here? Mm -hmm. Right? You know. And that's why I came to understand that to begin to understand that language can also be a mechanism for mental conditioning, you know, of our people. And I came to realize that for us in Africa is even more serious because majority of our people speak and operate in African languages anyway. Mm -hmm. So, by treating and uh, creating an intellectual community that can only put their thoughts in French, English, and Polish, but they can't put their thoughts in an African language. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's really devastating for a continent mm -hmm. to have this community of thinkers only able put their thoughts uh, in another language other than the language is spoken by the people. Because the other problems, publishing the problem, mm -hmm. if it's any writer who tries to write in an African language, the fact that they encounter who mm -hmm. is going to publish me. Where are the magazines that publish African stories? Mm -hmm. Where are the prizes mm -hmm. that I earmarked? For writing in an African language, okay, mm -hmm. and sometimes government policies, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Look, create conditions that enable or give opportunity to African intellectuals to write in an African language, even when they want to, mm -hmm. right? Because ninety percent of resources of our government anywhere in Africa. Anyway, ninety percent of resources that earmarked for education and the language aspect of that education, ninety percent goes to English, French, or Portuguese. Even though everybody in the country pays taxes, mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know that money that goes to English or French comes from. Everybody, including peasants and working people who speak African languages, it's as if African, African language speakers mm -hmm. contribute mm -hmm. towards a negation of themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So some of those are some of the difficulties. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah. about the publishing uh, difficulty, did you find that by translating the work from Kikuyu to English or from Kikuyu to whichever other uh, European language that 
that help to solve that problem or what no, was that, that process? No, 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 no. Translation is a very different thing altogether. It's very, mm -hmm. very important and I can come back to it, you know. Mm -hmm. But the question of publishing, I personally was very lucky mm -hmm. in the sense that my uh, Kenyan publishers, mm -hmm. the East African educational publishers, mm -hmm. were willing mm -hmm. to at least, mm -hmm. you know, uh, see what would happen mm -hmm. if they publish my books in Gikoyo. And when my first novel in Gikoyo came out, it's called Devil on the Cross, Shaitan mm -hmm. and the play, Gaika Deda, I'll marry when I want, which was jointly authored with the late Gogi uh, Wamiri, you know, um, the, the publishers were actually surprised mm. by the sales, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Of course, there may have been conditions at the time, particular political conditions, which many people want to know what I had written in prison, or or to want to buy a book for which I had been imprisoned, mm -hmm. or the play for which I had been imprisoned. Mm -hmm. So there are all those conditions, you know. Mm -hmm. But still, they were surprised by. For after so many years, the sales in the Koyo language kept pace with any other book they had published in English. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it can be done. But look at it this way. But just in terms of audience alone. Mm -hmm. Iceland mm -hmm. has only roughly say less than a million. Mm -hmm. uh, the population of Denmark is roughly four million. Mm -hmm. Okay, Yoruba people in Africa alone, mm -hmm. how many are they? <laughs> they estimate I think about ab about forty million. But let but let but let's say let's say between 10 and 40 million, take mm -hmm. any figure you want. Mm -hmm. Why is it that 4 million Danes can sustain a literature mm -hmm. and 40 or 10 to 40 million Yoruba cannot? Mm -hmm. You know, you can say the same thing. I'm sort of in Koyo, you know, about 10 million people, you know, Zulu, I don't know how many, you know, but certainly more than 5 million, um, mm -hmm. you know. What I'm trying to say is that if Danish language mm -hmm. can sustain uh, a literature and an, an entire production, mm -hmm. why not any of the African languages, mm -hmm. for instance? You know? mm -hmm. But ultimately, the question of language is a question of human right. Mm -hmm. It's not to do with whether how many books I write in it and so it is a human right. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think African governments mm -hmm. should put resources mm -hmm. towards African languages, okay, mm -hmm. you know. Then publishers and writers and others will, you know, necessarily follow. Mm -hmm. yeah. You said something earlier that um, I want to come back to because um, as I'm thinking mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. these processes and through these issues that we're encountering, mm -hmm. um, I'm very much concerned about how to operationalize mm -hmm. the thought, right? So I want to decolonize myself relative to hair. Mm -hmm. How do I do that? Well, I just wear my hair natural, right? Yeah. Um, I want to decolonize myself relative to language. How do I do that? Well, I just speak my language more. Um, I want to decolonize myself. In your case, um, uh, you decided to, to resume, as you put it, and I like how you put it, to resume writing in Kikuyu because it is the natural thing right. to do. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very concerned about operationalizing, me meaning making concrete in my day-to-day -day practice the things that I talk about, right? Now, one aspect of operationalizing is the concern of economics. How is someone to make sure that they're economically viable, meaning they're able to put food in their mouths, in the mouths of the people around them, 
um, while also doing the things that we do. It's not always a conflict, but sometimes, mm. you know, we, we have conflicts. But something you said earlier, um, you said that you are an English professor, and because of that, you do not have to rely upon how much you make uh, from your kikuyu writing. Um, mm -hmm. Would you please speak a little more to that? Yeah, of course, first of all, uh, writing in general mm -hmm. is not necessarily, whether in English or French or Portuguese, is not necessarily unviable economically. And mm -hmm. uh, there are very few writers, quite frankly, who live solely mm -hmm. on their writings, whether they are writing in English, you know, or French or Portuguese, you know. Uh, so, uh, for a writer, they still have to have another occupation mm -hmm. that brings, you know, bread, you know, and butter. Mm -hmm. Okay. In my case, you know, uh, I'm a graduate of uh, English literature. Mm -hmm. uh, I teach. You know, I'm a distinguished professor of uh, English and comparative literature mm -hmm. at the University of California, Irvine, mm -hmm. and I've been a university professor really all my life. So you like that's where I earn my living, mm -hmm. okay, my bread and butter, if you like, you know. Mm -hmm. But I could as easily mm -hmm. have been a business person, mm -hmm. you know, or, or say a farmer, you know, or a carpenter, mm -hmm. or you know, uh, that's my profession, if you like, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, mm -hmm. But that still does not uh, take away, you know, the challenge. Mm -hmm. Or my facing my relationship to my African you know, languages. Mm -hmm. you know. Of course, if I write in English, I sell probably many more books mm -hmm. in English. But that's because of conditioning. Mm -hmm. you know, okay, put it this way. If there are, say, 10 million mm -hmm. Ikoyo language speakers, mm -hmm. for instance, you know, um, if I could sell say, I wouldn't even say, if you could say, just imagine if I could sell just a million copies of my books to Ikoyo speakers alone, a million copies, that would be much more than I'm able to sell, you know, uh, in English, you know, anywhere in the world, you know, within, say, a year, two years, or three or five years, mm -hmm. okay, right, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but the reality is, we're in a vicious circle, mm -hmm. because there are no books in African, in African languages, therefore, very few readers mm -hmm. in African languages, therefore, even fewer publishers mm -hmm. who are willing to risk mm -hmm. uh, publishing mm -hmm. in African languages, you know. Uh, so everything feeds into each other. Mm -hmm. Negative government po policies means there's no viable options for publishers because many publishers depend on educational publishing, mm -hmm. publishing for this educational market, the school market, and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. So it enables them to get the, uh, the, the necessary amount of capital, if you like, mm -hmm. to sustain uh, publishing, say, artistic works, novels, and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But is the government policies themselves in the entire continent are geared promoting English and French and so on. It means that even the, the budget, the money for publishing in African languages from government for the needs of education in the country, mm -hmm. of course, will go to English and French. Mm -hmm. The publishers will go where money is. Right. Because publishers are not philanthropists. Mm -hmm. They are business people. They are there to make, you know, uh, a profit mm -hmm. or a living, mm -hmm. you know, it's only that the books is their business, okay? Mm -hmm. So you can't get a publisher who goes, publishes, say, a dozen copies in, say, Nikiko and he sells on one copy, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's not sustainable, you know, right? Yeah. So government policies need to actually change. Mm -hmm. Government policies need to be decolonized. And the people making those government policies need to be decolonized, mm -hmm. right? You mm -hmm. know, uh, if you have that, then 
everything will change. Right. Because I mean, government policies, publishing options, mm -hmm. and writer choices will more or less be uh, feed into each other, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? In a positive way. Mm -hmm. But just now, they feed each other in a negative way, mm -hmm. right? You know, because of vicious cycle. No good government policies, therefore no opening for publishers, therefore no very few books in African languages, therefore very few books are available in African languages, therefore very f few writers in African languages because they can't get publishers, I mean, mm -hmm. the whole, so somewhere we need to break through that vicious circle, mm -hmm. you know, right? Mm -hmm. And once we break it, we survive a new world. Why? Because there's nothing that says there's nothing wrong in a publishing or uh, writing your own language first, mm -hmm. then add English to it, mm -hmm. then add French mm -hmm. or many languages in the world. It's not called it's not a contradiction whatsoever. Mm -hmm. To know like you know, you know you know English and you know French. Huh? There's no contradiction. One does not negate the other. You, your knowledge of one does not make your knowledge of the other somehow kind of a problem. Right. <laughs> right. It deliberates you, right? Or at least in that it gives you more options. Mm -hmm. So this is what I've been telling uh, people in Kenya and wherever I'm able to speak. That if you know mm -hmm. all the languages of the world mm -hmm. and you don't know your mother tongue or the language of your culture, that is enslavement. If you know mm -hmm. all the languages of the world mm -hmm. and you do not know your mother tongue mm -hmm. or the language of your culture, mm -hmm. that is enslavement. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you know your mother tongue mm -hmm. or the language of the, your culture and you add all the languages of the world to it. Mm -hmm. That is empowerment, right? right? That's empowerment. You have your mother tongue, language, your culture, then you have whatever other languages you can add to that. Mm -hmm. Surely that, that's liberation, right? Empowerment, right? Right. Right. right? right. right. But the other one is enslavement. Right. And our colonial heritage has made us actually really opt for enslavement yes rather than empowerment yeah yes mm -hmm. um, one thing that I'm gathering mm -hmm. and perhaps you'll tell me otherwise mm -hmm. um, you said earlier when we were talking you said mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you're going to fight a war you fight on all fronts right mm -hmm. and we were talking about uh, I don't know how to say this about remaining diplomatic and, and not but anyway, just say it. Just say it. No diplomacy here. No diplomacy here. No diplomacy here. Um, well, the fact that sometimes you have to do certain things that perhaps are not what you would wish to do um, in order to enable yourself to maybe in the long run being able to attain what it is that you're wanting and I I am getting from this exchange that essentially that's a, a, a mantra perhaps with which we should walk is when you're fighting a war you fight on all fronts the the, the language question in Africa mm -hmm. It's both simple and also complicated. Yes. Right. You know. uh, by that I mean that there we have now a whole generation, mm -hmm. for instance, of children in Africa. Not, it's not their fault mm -hmm. in a way, who now cannot speak mm -hmm. their African mother tongue. Mm -hmm. In other words, you could argue that, in a sense, English 
is their mother tongue, mm -hmm. right? In their, you know, French is their mother tongue. In so far, but it, but it's not an African language. This is what I've been saying. That we make a mistake of confusing some of the two, mm -hmm. uh, where you, you have to do something. You are born into an English-speaking uh, family, mm -hmm. and you have to do what you have to do with what you have inherited. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, that's your starting point, mm -hmm. okay? And it's what you do with your starting point that becomes then very, very important. He was born, say, into an English speaking family. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I don't choose. Mm -hmm. I inherit that, you know. But there's no reason why if I add another language that cannot be an African language. Right. Right. Yeah, I have a choice there, right? Right. right? right. I'm, and and there's no reason why I can't use. In that sense, I can say I'm using English, but I'll be using it to espouse certain causes which empower, say, African people, including advocacy of African languages, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't mean you know, if I was born into, Fr into a French-speaking fam African family. I cannot at the same time see the contradiction in that situation and become an advocate mm -hmm. for uh, African languages, you know. Uh, and but there are other options. If I'm an English speaker, there's no reason why I cannot say also opt for translation. African languages need a lot of work mm -hmm. from English, from French, from Portuguese, from Chinese, from uh, from Latin, from Greek, translated into African languages. Again, that's something which you want is a knowledge of French and uh, Portuguese. One can use that knowledge differently. You know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, African literature or that. Well, I, I like to think of it as Europhone mm -hmm. African literature, without any negativity involved in that one. But just to describe the fact of African literature, uh, literature written by Africans, but in European languages, mm -hmm. you know, because you, you know, you know, you, you can so, so talk about Anglophone mm -hmm. uh, African literature, you know, Francophone African literature. Lusophone African literature. Why can't we, in general, call Europhone, you know, uh, African literature? You know, that means that African literature is literature written in African languages. You know, right. uh, just as English literature is literature written in English and French and so on. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if we have a vision a vision of where we want to go as Africa, yeah. then how we get there in terms of tactics and so on, you know, depends very much on the conditions in which we find ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now let me give you an example. During our struggle for independence in Kenya, during the, the period when uh, uh, the, the struggle led by Mao Mao, you know, mm -hmm. I, I remember that by night, up to 1952, mm -hmm. Africans who were educated in American schools or, or English co universities and so on, or sometimes educated in African run schools, they would actually be the one who would be reading English language newspapers or French language books, and then the thoughts they got from there, they would actually uh, try to translate them or pass them on mm -hmm. to African language speakers. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the intellectuals of those days, they knew both languages. They knew mm -hmm. both French and African languages. Mm -hmm. You know, The tragedy is when now we say our children, we must bring our children without them being able to speak African languages. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if you know both languages, French, English, and African languages, then 
you can you can write in an African language at least you can do translation from uh, European language into African languages mm -hmm. and African languages do need a lot of translations into them mm -hmm. yeah as, by the way, just as like all the other languages in the, in the world mm -hmm. have gained from translation from other languages. Right. Right, you know. I mean, most European languages initially, you know, depend on translation from Latin and Greek into, uh, sort of, uh, into f English, French, mm -hmm. and Portuguese. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, every language has gained from translations. There's no reason why African languages cannot equally Mm -hmm. gain from translation. Indeed. Um, there is one objection I got one day from one African person when I was speaking of uh, the importance of uh, knowing our own languages. Um, and this person was very much owning English as their language, as the thing that they identify in. Um, I have I have that conversation right in my mind, right. but I also have in my mind um, a story that you described in uh, uh, decolonizing the mind, um, where you're talking about your experience as a young kid in a colonial school, um, where you're speaking your language is prohibited, mm -hmm. and children are punished for speaking right. their own yeah. language, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, Incidentally, I was having a conversation with uh, an older cousin of mine, he's uh -huh. in his 50s, uh -huh. uh, late 40s, 50s, uh, and he had a similar experience mm. in Ivory Coast, which mm -hmm. is a French-speaking country, mm -hmm. right? So, two different countries, two different colonizers, mm -hmm. um, but same experience. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, others, I mean, the people uh, uh, of the Americas have yeah. had a similar experience yeah. mm -hmm. with language. And so it's interesting that you would get an African be an advocate of re maintaining this uh, alienation from our own selves and our own languages when there is this proof of this massive and systematic uh, forcing of the people away from themselves. Yeah. Because the result of that process of learning a language through violence mm -hmm. uh, or or ab abandoning a language through violence you mm -hmm. know uh, you know has a tendency of uh, no normalizing abnormality you know you you turn abnormality in a, into a normality and and once you do that everything else follows logically right yes. you know but the very base of it is because your turned was abnormal, literally, into uh, uh, the normal. You know, these experiments have been done with animals. Um, mm -hmm. One is where uh, Skinner, I think, you know, has talked very much about uh, behavior psychology. You mm -hmm. know, All right? Uh, this is where you reinforce mm -hmm. positive attitudes with reward mm. you know towards something mm -hmm. and the undesired behavior mm -hmm. you know is you inflict pain <laughs> right you know in other words the undesired the desire you don't want you associate with pain, mm -hmm. the desire you want to implant as a with with reward. Mm -hmm. Okay, so animals. No, I don't. This I don't know. Animals. You know, you you how do you train a, an animal? You know, when it doesn't do something, you beat it. Mm -hmm. Okay, you beat. It, you know, it, all right. When it does something nice, you give it something to eat. Mm -hmm. After some time, that animal begins to internalize. Mm -hmm. You know that if I go there, I get punishment. Mm -hmm. But if I do this, I get reward. Mm -hmm. So at some time, it begins to automatically avoid spaces of pain mm -hmm. and try to inhabit spaces of pleasure. Mm -hmm. oh, that is the reward. Mm -hmm. And after some time, this behavior is passed on 
to children, they are the animal children that is, mm -hmm. who now do things automatically. Mm -hmm. They don't even think about maybe the the other ones may have thought you know that no that if I do this pain, if I do this pleasure, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But the children will now be be will automatically be avoiding those spaces of pain mm -hmm. to inhabit spaces of you know of uh, of um, of, of pleasure, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. you know, which is exactly the same way we are trained, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, so English and French and so on. Associate African languages with pain mm -hmm. initially, mm -hmm. violence, not in violence, mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. or that or something. People have been made to swallow not just violence but swallow dirt mm. or stinky things. Mm -hmm. when they are caught speaking African languages in their school compound. Mm -hmm. I mean, you associate African language with stink, mm -hmm. with pain, mm -hmm. with punishment, mm -hmm. and so on. So naturally, you begin to avoid mm -hmm. <laughs> that spa space of pain mm -hmm. and occupy the space of reward, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. But after that, was, you pass this on to the children mm -hmm. who now take automatically. It's just, they don't even think about it, mm -hmm. you know? You have passed it on to them, you know. Uh, but the experiment which was done was um, Pavlov. In mm -hmm. You remember the experiment he does, you know, with uh, the rats or something, where you know uh, he provides food to this ex to to the object of his experimentation, mm -hmm. uh, it rings a bell, uh, food, and the animal salivates, eats food. Mm -hmm. Later, he only needs to ring. The sound of a bell, mm -hmm. uh, the sound alone will make the animal salivate. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And in the same way, mm -hmm. languages, if you ask many people, why does English sound more intelligent? They really have no idea <laughs> if you say the sound of an English word may evoke intelligence mm -hmm. and complexity. Mm -hmm. and the sound of an African word may evoke other things, you know, that are not complexity, simplicity, it's because the very sound mm -hmm. of English has now come to you salivate linguistically when you hear the sound of English, you know. <laughs> that's so, a that's um, beautiful and, metaphor. And the mouth dries up mm -hmm. at the sound of an English, <laughs> uh, of an African sound, <laughs> an African sound. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the key thing is how there's this trauma mm. is not passed on intergenerationally. Because they know you ask me why they don't and even they come with absurd abs explanations. Mm -hmm. They've never even thought about it mm -hmm. because it's been normalized. A very common uh, example of what you're saying mm -hmm. is uh, how people automatically call an African language a dialect. Right. This is done by Africans, it's right. done by mm -hmm. non Africans mm -hmm. automatically. Um, you uh. speak to an African person and you say, oh, what languages do you speak? They'll say, I speak French, Portuguese, English, Arabic, uh. um, and a dialect, an, an, an African dialect. Oh, is, is it not even <laughs> worth mentioning the name uh. of this? Uh, so then you probe some uh. further and then they might say the name of, of uh. the dialect. Uh. But it's just interesting that automatically the language is mm. deemed a dialect. <laughs> no, this is absurd. First of all, in general, by the way, right. this idea that there are languages and dialects mm -hmm. anywhere where there's English and so on, I mean, is nonsense. Right, right. They're just different structures of a language. You, right. know, you know, like say, for instance, the, the language is developed by African people out of conditional exile mm -hmm. in the Caribbean, in Haiti, and other places, you know. Mm -hmm. Those they are not dialects of English. They are not bad English or bad French or whatever. They, they are simply new languages. You mm -hmm. know. Uh, uh, but I agree with you. There is always automatic association of African languages with non-being, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Almost like yeah, non-being. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is not so much when others do that, 
is when Afghan, we Afghan people are saying, when we do that, mm -hmm. then that's where the problem is. That's where the problem is. Colonization and decolonization comes in, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, you can understand why there is this automatic. It is automatic. Some people don't even think about it mm -mm. because we have to normalize mm -hmm. the abnormal and turn it into the normal. That's really a problem. By the way, this question of violence, as you mentioned. It's not even Africa. It was not done to African first, actually, although we have been. The Irish. Yeah? It's done with the Irish. It was done with the Scottish. It's gone with the Welsh. The Welsh were made to carry a little plates called Welsh Knot mm -hmm. and were equally punished. Right? Mm -hmm. So, this, as, this use of violence mm -hmm. to train a people to to run away from that which causes pain has been used centuries over mm -hmm. right it's only that in the case of Africa because of total colonization by Europe you know they became concentrated mm -hmm. for instance when Africans were brought to the new world by force mm -hmm. the first thing that was done to our people mm -hmm. was break their languages, mm -hmm. you know, stop them from speaking African languages, right? Whereas Europeans and slavers, their linguistic connections to France, to Spain, to Portugal, to England, that was left intact. Mm -hmm. But African people's connection to their linguistic base in Africa, that was consciously, consciously and deliberately worked upon. So much so that even the drum, mm -hmm. talking drum, was actually banned on the um, plantations. Uh, yeah, plantations. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So, if you look at the whole thing, you can see the consequence of that for the psyche, mm -hmm. you know, is once again to think that English and French and French are no more language, but they are no any more normal than Yoruba, than Chinese, than Kiswahili, than Kikuyu, than any of the Native American languages, you know. There is nothing more normal about English than it is normal for Native American languages or Canadian Native, Native Canadian languages or Austrian native languages. No. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. You know. They are languages with their different musicalities, their different potentialities, you know. And the question of language between one language and another, between one another language, is really a question of power. Mm -hmm. Right. You know. uh, otherwise, what's more natural than I know one language? Mm -hmm which especially my own language and I add other languages to it. To me that's be normal. That's be <laughs> how it should be. Right. right? Right. I know my language and if I want to know another language I add to it and right. so and so. But this other one, conscious erasure of connection of one one's connection to one's own mm -hmm. and then complete identification with that which is not one's own mm -hmm. and uh, begin to act as if there are some magical properties that the language of my owner has mm -hmm. that mine doesn't mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. is so absurd mm -hmm. but we have been normalized into thinking that's the case mm -hmm. yeah yeah um Ngugi. Thank you so very much. I want to end with a story you told me earlier, the story of uh, perseverance of your brother, if you don't mind. Oh, right. Uh, now I was talking about my brother, whom I mentioned, by the way, also in the colonies, uh, in uh, um, Dreams and Dreams Time of War. War. You know, yeah. yeah, he's called Mwangi, and, uh, you know, uh, in Kenya. Kenya was a settler, a British settler colony. Mm -hmm. And 
land was always a basic issue between African people in Kenya and uh, British white settlers. Okay, Kenya was colonized from about 1895 to 1963. Uh, but in Kenya, the movement called Land and Freedom Army, mm -hmm. otherwise popularly known as Mau Mau, mm -hmm. was the one which led the struggle for you know uh, for independence. And the young people, like my brother, went to the mountains you know, to fight against the British colonial state. Mm -hmm. okay. Before my brother went to the mountains to fight, he was actually doing very good as a carpenter. His own business as a carpenter, he used furniture, he did lots of things, you know. Uh, but when he went to fight in the mountains, he lost everything. Later he was captured and he was taken to a concentration camp. So after many years, he comes back with nothing. Mm. And he started from zero. Building himself all over again. And towards the end of his life, he was actually owner of several properties, including a, a, a shoe, a store for shoes, you know, right? To, I know I, I want to mention it because I think they say that the worst thing uh, in falling is never to rise up mm -hmm. <laughs> right mm -hmm. you know uh, the worst thing that can happen to you is if an enemy knocks you down mm -hmm. for you to s stay down there then that's in fact in some way worse than the fact that he knocked you down. Right. You know? Because you have a responsibility when you are knocked down and down there is to rise again. Yeah? Right. So in the same way, and you can say, oh, but what I think is so difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have no other option if you want to. <laughs> 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 you know, it's you not a choice. You, you, know, you, 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 not say, you, you don't want to please the person who knocked you down. Mm -hmm. You don't want to go there and tell please. You don't preach to him, oh, you know, it's morally, it's very ungodly to knock somebody down, <laughs> you know, and, oh, please help me. Mm -hmm. But he knocked you down mm -hmm. deliberately. Mm -hmm. So it's not for you to preach to him, mm -hmm. or I beg him to lift you up. Mm -hmm. It's for you to say, I'll rise, you know. And I'll rise again, and every time I knock down, I'm going to try, I'm not stay there. I'm going to rise again. Right. And you can't say, it's too difficult. Why? If that difficult, then you do the best you can to overcome those mm -hmm. difficulties, you know. Right. You don't come, you don't say, oh, I'm very comfortable down here, <laughs> because the person who knocked me down, now he brings me a little milk sometimes. And he brings me water a little tiny, you know, and I'm quite comfortable <laughs> really lying down here <laughs> because sometimes, you know, when I've got a wound, he comes and binds the wound and so on. No, you know, you rise again. And African intellectuals have no alternative. It's really, we have a response to our history. Mm -hmm. We have to connect with. African languages, no matter how difficult it is, mm -hmm. no matter how long it takes, and so on, you know. And the more we know of other languages, mm -hmm. the more incumbent upon us mm -hmm. to be able to put that knowledge into African languages. Yeah. And when you go in and go to these things, for the ownership of our own bodies, mm -hmm. ownership of our own resources, mm -hmm. right? And the ownership of our own resources begins with the resources of our own body. Mm -hmm. Because remember, the real uh, colonization of Africa begins with the enslavement of the body mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. The body is the first thing to be taken away, you know. So, uh, so the resources of the body are the primary resources we have. That means my hair, my skin color, my language, those are the resources of the body, you know. But we have to go beyond that, secure the
the resources of the continent so we make things with our own resources mm -hmm. you know not not sending raw materials to Europe <laughs> to have them and mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that it is fair exchange but being able to make things with our diamonds with mm -hmm. our copper with our cocoa mm -hmm. with our sisal mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and meet the others from China from America from in the marketplace mm -hmm. of things and ideas mm -hmm. and so on mm -hmm. you know right let me just end up you know with this uh, which I'm actually using a lot in my recent talks in Kenya Zambia and other places you know that Europeans or, or Western powers or European powers let me put that way gave us the resources of their accent mm -hmm. right we gave Europe uh, access <laughs> to our resources mm -hmm. uh, so f for their accents we give them access mm -hmm. and you ask me that's a problem we have in Africa mm -hmm. the middle class we are so busy you know perfecting our English our French and so on you know and I know this because in Kenya where I come from you say go Africa they laugh at each other while speaking bad English. Oh, they laugh, you know. Mm -hmm. We're so, it's like speaking English perfectly. And there's nothing wrong with speaking English perfectly. Don't get me wrong. I'm just mm -hmm. saying this obsession right. with perfection for uh, an English accent, and you don't look around and say, who owns the banks in Kenya? Right, <laughs> right, right. you know. Right. You know who pours the diamonds and the copper and diamond and the gold and uranium and oil. You know, someone is doing that when we are perfecting these accents. Someone is perfecting the instruments or the access to those resources. Yes. Right. Yes. That is so very accurate. Yeah. You know. The question I keep on asking people is this. You go to, and I've been challenging, wherever I go, whether in Ghana, you know, Zambia, Kenya, I've been asking them, people who, because we have traveled all over the world, okay? Mm -hmm. So I ask them, you know, when you go to New York, or London, or Paris, how many African-owned banks mm -hmm. do you find operating in those streets? Mm -hmm. I said, and by the way, how many African-owned diamond companies mm -hmm. do you find operating in Europe? Mm -hmm. or, or uranium or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or how many have you come across African military having joint military exercises with the French army on French soil, mm. or on English soil, mm -hmm. or on American soil, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I said, if you want to ask them, ask them, you want to know the linguistic balance of power, mm -hmm. just walk into the street of any African capital mm -hmm. and see what you see there mm -hmm. by your banks, industries, and so on. Mm -hmm. Then again walk in the streets of Paris or London or wherever mm -hmm. and just see again you know what you see in the and compare mm -hmm. in terms of ownership and control mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. uh, see how many African owned things you find in Europe mm -hmm. and compare with how many European owned things mm -hmm. you find in Africa mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. yeah. right thank you yeah. thank you that is very accurate these are issues that we'll need to continue working on and that you have been working on quite a bit yourself which is why you're such mm. a treasure to people like me and, and others mm. so thank you again for Th thank you for I, the I'm time. happy with what you're doing I think we need young people like you to be focusing on some of these issues otherwise if young people begin to normalize absurdities and abnormalities 
then Africa will be lost. Right. <laughs> right? Right. 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 But you want people like you who they know they have the African base in their bodies, in their languages, and then they have knowledge of the world as well. <laughs> right? So they can see Africa in the world, but from their own base, right? You know, uh, we end up with this. If today mm -hmm. somebody mm -hmm. came to your house mm -hmm. and attacked your daughter or your son, mm -hmm. you die protecting that son mm -hmm. or daughter. Mm -hmm. If they came, somebody came to your house today and took away or to manage things in your own house, mm -hmm. you kick that person out and mm -hmm. go out, go and manage things in your own place, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You'd actually protect that which is around you. You you die actually protecting mm -hmm. that. Was that different from your own house, from the national house, the nation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Right. Why? Why is it is all right for other people? Not whatever their motives, whatever they care, whatever they gain from it, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Why is it all normal mm -hmm. for somebody to come and occupy, work things around your house, mm -hmm. <laughs> but not somehow normal for you to go and work things around their own house, right. their other houses, and so on? Well, but it's only African people mm -hmm. who can protect mm -hmm. African resources, mm -hmm. make things with those resources, mm -hmm. and then exchange with the world, mm -hmm. you know, on the basis of equal give and take. Yes. I'm not talking about isolation. I'm just equal give, equal take. Yes. But just now, Africa, for the last so many years, this century has been continually donating to the West. Yes. If, if, no matter what area you look at, it's Africa which always gives to the West. Africa is the eternal giver mm -hmm. to the West. Right? Mm -hmm. But things have been turning the other way around. So as long as you as Africa, which is an eternal beggar, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Thank you so very, very, very much. Well, thank, thank you very much, and continue with your blog. You thank know, yeah, you, it's will uh, do. Wonderful, because you are raising issues, I think, which are very, very important. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So, uh, thank you guys for joining us. Please uh, get uh, Ngugi's books, Decolonizing the Mind, the Politics of uh, Language uh, in uh, African Literature. Uh, dreams in a time of war uh, and then there are others so thank you for joining us this was an honor a blessing, everything, thank you so much bye bye, yeah. bye. Yeah.